We are honored and fortunate to have with us today, Professor Reni M. Borges. Professor Borges is an evolutionary biologist. She is a professor at the Indian Institute of Science. Professor Borges was elected a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences in 2009 and a fellow of the Indian National Science Academy in 2016. Professor Borges is a well acclaimed person. She is an expert in her area, which she will speak on today, the economic diversity of India. Professor Borges at present is a Jesse Bose National Fellow at the Center for Ecological Sciences at IISC. Professor Borges, over to you. Thank you so much, Deepa, and thank you to the uh, Association of Science Museums in India for coming forward to organize this uh, lovely uh, collection where we are celebrating, as uh, Professor Tirthankar just said, uh, celebrating uh, the diversity in India. And uh, today I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, the celebration of ecological uh, diversity. India is such a rich country, it, and I hope by the end of my talk, you will be able to answer the question, uh, why do we have such a wide diversity of ecosystems in India? And I really would like you to to tell me at the end of the talk if you think that you have the answers because it's it's a very important question that we also need to address uh, of course before uh, you know to put this whole question into context it's always nice sometimes to take a zoom out view and the biggest zoom out view one could take is to think of the earth and uh, other planets uh, where we have, you know, the Earth orbiting around the sun. And it's interesting, but it's believed that given the sun of a particular size and therefore with a particular temperature, there is only a, a very narrow zone which one considers to be habitable. And Earth, and that's why I suppose we are here today, uh, because we life as we know it seems to you know fall within this habitable zone and that's why earth is often referred to as a goldilocks planet it's not too hot it's not too cold it's somewhere in between yes and that's really important for us to keep in mind similarly when we are talking about uh, ecosystems we can start, as I said, uh, start with the whole globe and start thinking about global processes uh, of the whole biosphere. And then we can come down to ecosystems. And usually ecosystems are those which exchange uh, energy. So there's energy flux. There is also cycling of nutrients between the various compartments in an ecosystem. And of course, if you want to build up from the bottom towards an ecosystem, you have the organisms, you have populations of these organisms, and then you have a community where populations of one species are interacting with other species of plants and animals. Now, it's not only plants and animals, but this illustration also tells you that there, are, there is soil, there are volcanoes, there are eruptions, there are abiotic processes also. And therefore, to look at the Earth as a planet and having planetary scale as well as local scale processes, I think is very important in our overall understanding of India and all its ecosystems. So if you therefore, you know, want to take an ecosystem approach, uh, it's, you know, one analogy is 
you think of the Russian doll or the Matryoshka approach where, you know, or like an onion skin that I have here at the bottom, you keep peeling and peeling and peeling and peeling and then you try to get to the smallest level that is possible for one to get to. So if you take, therefore, an ecosystem approach, there are so many scales. So there's a scale of the gene, the life stages, individuals, population, species, communities, and various taxonomic groups that constitute the ecosystem. And then you can look at scales of, in this uh, figure, going from weeks to months to years to decades and to centuries, because there are some things that, you know, the effects are not known immediately, but will take some time uh, to make themselves evident. And then, of course, you can have the local, regional, so-called national scale, a continental scale, and a global scale. And in all these scales, you can see that the ecosystems are nested. They are one within the other, yes? And therefore affected by local, regional, and global processes. So this is an important perspective. Now, to give you an example, most recently when I said that uh, you can have transcontinental effects so uh, all of us have been alarmed with uh, the fires that have been taking place throughout the globe. And this is a 2020 graphic of the distribution of fires in Australia. And you can see that Australia is about, you know, 2,400 kilometers as the crow flies from New Zealand. But here you can see the impact where the white glaciers of New Zealand have turned brown, and this is because of the impact of the fires that are so many thousands of kilometers away. What this tells us is that there are atmospheric and continental processes. So, uh, yes, Australia is an island. You know, we often say no man is an island or no woman is an island, however you want to put it. But it, it's, uh, it's true because what happens in one part will affect even uh, processes uh, that in places that are very, very far away. So this is something that we must absolutely keep in mind. There are no closed compartments within ecosystems. And if we therefore take terrestrial ecosystems, uh, conventionally people have divided them up into what are called biomes. And, uh, you know, you can look at some axes uh, on which these biomes can be uh, construct. I mean, described. So you can have uh, evapotranspiration, how much is being evaporated based on the heat index, the winds, etc. This is humidity on this axis. Uh, humidity in terms of how much relative humidity is retained, and you have annual precipitation in this axis. So if you combine this, uh, you can see that you will have, based on latitudes, you go from tropical all the way to polar. And uh, similarly, within, in an altitudinal sense, which happens even in India, you can go from lowland to pre-montane, to montane, and even in alpine and beyond the tree line, which happens in uh, the high Himalayas and in some of the higher mountains in southern India. So um, biomes in, in a terrestrial, uh, in, on land, I'm not talking about aquatic uh, biomes right now, but they can be therefore def uh, defined usually by looking at the amount of solar radiation that is received and the amount of annual precipitation. Now, ecosystems, you know, many times uh, one could ask, why do we need to bother about ecosystems? 
why can't we just have concrete jungles and, you know, build more and more cities and have more and more towns and roads and railways, et cetera, et cetera. And it is for this very reason that uh, people have started working and defining and communicating to you know, the rest of uh, people who may not have knowledge about this in terms of the relatively free ecosystem services that nature provides. Uh, nature doesn't ask for a toll tax. Nature is just providing these services for free. And you can see there's a whole range of these services, whether it be photosynthesis or soil formation or providing food or you know, uh, clean air or storing carbon. There are also cultural values because I'm sure that all of us will realize that uh, uh, life in a concrete jungle is not really, uh, you know, fun. And particularly uh, when we have all been cooped up over the last two years in not able to enjoy, you know, the wonderful ecosystems that we have outside our homes, we would, I'm sure, have realized the deep bond that humans have with uh, natural systems. So it's important to look at uh, these ecosystem services. Uh, a good friend of mine, Madhav Gadgil, would always, and I always like to quote his, his term when he said that uh, natural systems are like natural ATMs. You can just go and they give you these services, okay? And for many people living in forested and natural systems, these are the true ATMs, the true capital that we actually have inherited. And, you know, uh, as all good bankers or all good uh, custodians of capital, we need to save this capital and protect it so that it generates interest for the future. Now, various people have tried to understand the workings of ecosystems, and people have tried to capture ecosystems within artificial confines. And these are the famous Biosphere 1 and Biosphere 2 experiments in uh, North America, where pe uh, people try to put in combinations of plants and algae and microbes and some organisms, some animals, and even had people living in it for extended periods of time to try and understand, you know, how are these processes of nutrient cycling, uh, you know, conversion of material, which happens seamlessly in natural systems, but many times we do not understand them well enough. So these are the types of larger scale experiments that have been done. But of course, a lot of people also try and do smaller experiments in what I call a mesocosm. For example, the so-called ecotrons in Mopellier, which try to uh, give controlled environments in which plants and other organisms can be cultured, or the so-called underground earth trons in Japan, where people are concerned about uh, soil ecosystems, and we do not understand enough about ecosystems in the soil. So these, this is a recent attempt, or a limnotron, which is trying to look at, uh, you know, freshwater ecosystems or exposed outdoor artificial ponds in the Netherlands or oceanic so-called planktotrons where uh, seawater and uh, sea uh, plankton that live in the sea, this is in Germany, people are trying to do these large, uh, not biosphere scale, but smaller scale kind of experiments. And then, of course, you have the artificial microcosms. And every time one does, you know, putting bacteria or whatever in a petri dish or in a flask, 
you can generate a microcosm and you can control all the features to understand this. And of course, people like the famous Richard Lenski have spent a lot of their time and years trying to understand long-term evolutionary processes within, uh, particularly using bacteria like E. coli, uh, to see and understand uh, you know, how ecosystems and ecological processes can uh, then, uh, you know, evolve into uh, changes in populations uh, and utilization of nutrients and so on. So these, as I said, we've got uh, people trying to, you know, understand under captive or uh, enclosed conditions how ecosystems work. Now let's come to India. And I told you that, uh, you know, one can, I told you India was part of, you know, Earth is part of the solar system, and then India is part of a very, very ancient. So India wasn't always India as we think of it today, but India was really part of a much larger and older continent. And you can see here that the position of India and all the seas around it, and I particularly will draw your attention to the Tethys Sea because we will talk about that a little later. And you can see that through the processes of continental drift, India started moving along with associated land masses, whether it's 71 million years, 55 million and 38 million years, when it made grazing contact with Southeast Asia and then crashed into the Eurasian plate, and that gave rise to the Himalayas. Now, we also know that around 65 million years was also the age of when the dinosaurs went extinct. And yes, when India was, was being rafted towards the crash with the Eurasian plate, India had dinosaurs. And these are all the fantastic dinosaurs that India had. Uh, imagine, I mean, if I had a time machine, it would be so wonderful to be able to go back to that time when, you know, giants, they, they estimate that Rajasaurus uh, was actually almost the equivalent of Tyrannosaurus rex. And we have Indosuchus or Jabalpuria, and, uh, found near the Jabalpur, which is in uh, Madhya Pradesh. So, you know, amazing dinosaurs. And what you see here are the fossil beds, places where uh, today they have found uh, fossil dinosaurs. Of course, unfortunately, in India, we haven't paid enough attention to dinosaurs. People use dinosaur eggs as grinding stones when they find them. Uh, people have ground up dinosaurs as used the, uh, bones and used them in limestone uh, constructions and quarries. And that's really unfortunate because, as you can see, we've had a rich history of uh, dinosaur uh, and their ecosystems. So I told you, yes, that India was uh, moving and then was going to crash into uh, the Teth I mean, into Eurasia, which obliterated the Tethys Sea. And in this process of obliterating the Tethys Sea by, you know, crashing into this uh, land mass, what happened was the Himalayas came up. And if you go to the Himalayas, and there are marvelous places where one can, and I have done this myself, and I can vouch for this, you can collect fossils, uh, marine fossils, which will date back from the time when the Tethys Sea was obliterated by the Himalayas. So you can see that we have an imprint of the marine ecosystems that were present in the Tethys Sea. And of course, because the Ammonites were the most abundant at that time, and uh, possibly more easily fossilized, uh, we have a good record of these different creatures that were present in the ancient uh, Indian plate. And then, you know, it crashed into the and formed the Himalayas. 
Uh, one important thing, as I said, when we think of India and its ecosystems, we need to look at the location of our country also and exactly where it is placed with regard to the Tropic of Cancer, the Equator and the Tropic of Capricorn. Unlike, you know, Southeast Asia, which is mostly equatorial, India is above that. So India does not get perhaps as much, you know, regular precipitation as uh, areas in the equator get. We do get a lot of precipitation, but that precipitation is dictated by the fact that India is also connected to a big land mass and also has big oceans around it. And con as a consequence of this, you know, we get two big monsoons in India. We get, of course, the southwest monsoon, which is actually an ocean to land. So it starts off in the ocean and it comes onto land. And then we get the northeast monsoon, where the winds start on land and then come down into the ocean, come across. So these are two very, very different uh, rain bearing systems. And these are the two systems that have nurtured India. And it's actually because of that location of India connected to a big land mass and then surrounded by huge oceanic expanses which have given India this uh, gift, if you want to call it, of uh, these two very, very different uh, monsoonal systems. So if we start, you know, way up in Leh Ladakh, and this is Leh Ladakh over here, these are the cold deserts. So if, and uh, for me, this is the most marvelous part of, of our country. Uh, it's hard to imagine a cold desert, but yes, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, going, you know, over the Himalayas and uh, what's happening uh, beyond the Himalayas. And here you have a typical representative uh, creatures and types of vegetation. So from, you know, the cold desert, and this is where one would have uh, what I showed you was really images from uh, the Zanskar range in Ladakh. But then you hop over and you get over, well, you know, the high Himalayas and then you cross the Gangetic Plain and then you are into a hot desert. Now, there are very few countries that have both a cold desert as well as a hot desert, you know, that they can say that, you know, these are our ecosystems. So the Thar Desert is another amazing uh, place. And once again, the Thar Desert also has a signature of marine life. And there are lots of marine fossils in the Thar. Because once again, the Thar, parts of the Thar were uplifted. So you do get very substantial fossils, even of marine life in the Thar. And of course, if you come a little uh, further south, you get the amazing salt pans, the wetlands, the scrublands uh, of what we know as the Great and the Little Ram of Kutch. And these are again a very unique ecosystems with thorny scrub. Uh, some of the lakes here are able to support uh, particularly uh, huge numbers of breeding flamingos and many other wetland bird species. Uh, really unusually uh, rich ecosystem, even though, you know, it looks so bleak as a landscape. And of course, if you come a little further south and in this green patch over here, is our fantastic uh, deer forest. Now I put up this map here because you can see Africa and you can see India and that little red dot there is gear. And what you see over here was the ancient range of the Indian lions. So lions are really uh, two subspecies. You have uh, Panthera leo, leo uh, 
melanochaeta, which are mostly found in Kenya, Tanzania. And then you have Panthera leo leo, which you know, was spread all over Iraq, Iran, the Middle East, and into much of India, but today remains in this one tiny population. Of course, we know that uh, anything that is in a small isolated population is very vulnerable, as are the gear lions. And the gear lions can only survive if there is sufficient uh, prey base for them because they are carnivores. So they have to have uh, habitat suitable for prey such as deer, uh, buffalo, uh, other smaller, you know, ungulates. And of course, they have competition from other carnivores such as leopards in this region. Now, this is interesting. I told you about the flamingos, which are traditionally used to breed in the Ran of Kutch. And over the last 15 years, a very strange phenomenon has occurred because the flamingos are now actually migrating in large numbers to New Bombay. Now, Bombay never had flamingos ever all these centuries as far as human history can remember. But suddenly, over the last 15 years, flamingos have become uh, an attraction. And you can see that the high-rise buildings in New Bombay and all the masses of flamingos. And we believe that this is a novel and perhaps a system that is going to crash because it is probably fueled by the blooms of crustacea and algae that are fueled by siltation, by sewage, as well as by the temperature of hot water, which is released by thermal plants in this area. So scientists are very uh, keenly studying this phenomena to understand why the Ran of Kutch flamingos have now made Bombay their second home. So this is almost like a new ecosystem uh, which has emerged. Now, India has lots of hills behind, besides the high Himalayas. And of course, we've got the Western Ghats. We've got the ancient hills of which you have probably also heard about in last time's presentation. But I just want to focus here on this hill range here that, you know, we call uh, the, the Western Escarpment. It's almost like the Western Spine of India. And this is what that spine looks like. Uh, many people, you know, are so fascinated by views of the Grand Canyon in the United States. And I always tell such people that we have our own beautiful Grand Canyons in India and we need to go and see them. And this is one of those spectacular views of the basaltic layers, the Deccan Trap uh, volcanic larvae that were laid down, you know, layer by layer to create a very unique system. So you have stunted forest on the crest and then you also have a fantastic world of what are called lateritic plateaus. So this is in the drier season and this is almost the same view when the plateau starts blooming and the whole plateau turns different colors, pink or yellow or purple with wonderful flowers, activity of insects, very specialized reptiles and this is the beauty of laterite. Laterite is this wonderful reddish uh, rock, which is highly porous also. So on top of the hard granite uh, basalt, the larval uh, basalt, we have a lateritic uh, ferritic cap, which is very typical of the Western Ghats in the so-called Deccan Plateau. Uh, it doesn't occur, uh, and that's mostly in the state of Maharashtra. It does not occur uh, in the, the state of Karnataka. If we come still further south and we go higher up in the mountains, and this is a view, all of you must have heard of the Nilgiri Mountains. And the Nilgiri Mountains have a fascinating um, melange or mixture 
of these brassy tops and thick forests in the valleys. So the brassy tops are, you know, the grasslands and these forests are called shola forests in the local language. So most of the higher mountains, you know, in the Nilgiris and in the southern western Ghats have this wonderful combination. And in this wonderful combination of forests, in the grasslands, you get unique uh, ungulates like the Nilgiri Thar and, of course, a whole set of unique birds and plants and uh, provides the flowering plants will provide, you know, ample uh, scope for the bees to proliferate. And so this is a very unique kind of landscape. Now, it's even more unique because we know today that the Nilgiri Thar over here and the Himalayan Thar and uh, in the Nilgiris we have a rhododendron and this is a Himalayan rhododendron. They are like two separate pockets, one in the Himalayas and one in the Nilgiris and this is what are called disjunct populations. And we now believe that these were, uh, you know, India before uh, uh, after it crashed into the Himalayas and then we had lots of glaciations called the Pleistocene glaciations. And people believe that these were refugia or places where these uh, cold and temperate species uh, could take refuge because the mountain tops were places where the climate was suitable for them. Yes. So you can see the Himalayan Thar because the temperatures are higher, has a very thick coat of a uh, lot of hair. And the Nilgiri Thar, it is cold up in the Nilgiris, but not to the temperatures that, uh, you know, occur in the high Himalaya. So this is again, you know, uh, telling us that we need ancient history to try and understand why uh, you have uh, rhododendrons and Himalayan thars over here and then absolutely nothing in between and then you suddenly have uh, Nilgiri thar and Nilgiri rhododendrons separated by so many thousands of kilometers. So in the, in the Nilgiris, as we know, we also have uh, tea and coffee estates and to lower down you have very well manicured tea gardens. And this is a drone shot taken by a drone, which shows that in between these well manicured tea gardens, you also have remnants of some in, uh, older forests. So it gives us an indication that this is what the forest was like before the tea gardens came and before all of this was uh, cut down in order to plant this monoculture of tea. Uh, you know, if you want to look at all the different, different forest types in India, they're too many and they're too confusing. And this was really the simplest figure I could find. Uh, and you can see most of the forests in India come within this red category, which is dry, deciduous, and thorny forest. So I've told you about the Thar Desert, and I've told you about the Western Ghats, which get all the monsoon rain, but this is in the rain shadow area. So you will get very dry forests over here. And consequently, the wet forests that get both the monsoons, the Northeast and the Southwest monsoon, are confined to the tip of India over here and in Northeast India because that gets the brunt, you know, gets both the precipitations and therefore you can get the wet evergreen forests which are more equatorial in nature only in these two parts of the country. And in the rest you get a moister forests but still deciduous forests where they don't retain uh, all the leaves throughout the year. Now there are some very unusual uh, 
landscapes even within these forests. And I'm giving you an example of what we call freshwater meristica swamps. And these are very special only in Karnataka and Kerala. And these are like, uh, they look like mangroves, but they are not mangroves because mangroves are in brackish water near the sea. But because it's a swampy, boggy, and oxic environment, the tree roots have found a way to survive the anoxia. So this is a very, very special type of uh, ecosystem. And uh, there are many cartoons, sad cartoons actually. And if those of you who haven't been introduced to uh, ecological Indian cartoonist who has, who comes under the name of Green Humor, I would recommend that you go to the website of Green Humor because he's got cartoons on so many uh, uh, issues that are very pertinent to to uh, to India. Yeah, it's only focused on the Indian scenario. And this is one such cartoon about the Meristica swamps, which has very typical Meristica frogs, Meristica crabs. It's a whole a world, a tiny world, which, uh, you know, exists in small pockets in the country. India also has coral reefs. So in the Gulf of Kutch, new coral reefs found uh, off the coast of uh, Maharashtra in Malvan, Lakshmadweep, the Gulf of Manar, and of course, the Andaman and the Nicobar Islands. And more and more, we are realizing uh, about, you know, the life, the coral life that uh, we have in our waters. If you go to the Nicobars, and this is mini koi, you can see uh, the shallow, the beautiful white sands, and then the shallow waters, which require to be shallow for the photosynthesis to occur in the coral zooplankton and phytoplankton. And here you have another shot of a little island in the Lakshwati. And you can see all the resorts that have been built, um, you know, on stilts because Lakshwadeep doesn't have much land. But I just want you to think about, you know, this pristine environment and then, you know, uh, what we are hard doing uh, in order to so-called enjoy it. And consequently, for the locals in Lakshwadeep, recently, they have been engaged in uh, protests because they want uh, everybody to realize that particularly in the face of climate change, uh, if we are going to have a rise in, in uh, seawater levels, uh, Lakshwadweep and other such islands which are really low-lying and where elevation is not very much at all, uh, what is going to happen to such islands uh, if we are not very careful about climate change. This is in the Andaman Islands. And uh, just a, an image to again show you that this is another beautiful part, actually part of a submerged mountain range. So if you look on the map, the Andaman Islands, if you draw a line straight up to Myanmar, uh, the Andaman Islands are the tops of a sunken mountain range. So when the sea levels rose up, the Arakan Yoma mountains that uh, stretch from Myanmar all the way down, uh, the tallest mountains remained as the Andaman Islands. Today we have uh, some islands that are left undisturbed, have white sands, and very close to the sands you have these beautiful towering closed canopy uh, tropical forests. As you can see, the Andamans are closer to the equator and therefore have more precipitation and therefore more likely to sustain a tropical evergreen forest. Now, of course, we have to think of our shoreline. And in our shoreline, we've got, uh, and I want to draw your attention to this fantastic website, which is curated in India, which is called wherearemycitations.co.in. And you can, you know, click on regions where you want to know what are the whales and 
dolphins that you will see around your coastline. And what is highlighted in blue over here are all the dolphins and whales that come into the Indian waters and therefore, you know, are part of this global ecosystem of which India is also a part. Now, if we go further up the east coast of India, of course, we've got the mighty Sundarbans. And here, you know that we share the Sundarbans with uh, Bangladesh. And so the Indian part of the Sundarbans is this line over here. This is sort of roughly in this map, you can see it. And uh, you can also see that uh, this is another very vulnerable part of the world. Very low lying and very unusual uh, uh, true mangroves, not like the Meristica swamps that I told you about earlier. Uh, but again, extremely low lying, extremely vulnerable to sea level rise. So places like Bangladesh and the Sundarbans in India are like Lakshmadweep and some of the islands in the Andaman and Nicobars are going to be extremely vulnerable to climate change. And uh, these are remarkable, um, you know, uh, the Sundarbans are formed part of the delta of the Brahmaputra. So uh, it's amazing how unique this system is. And similarly, if you talk about this great Brahmaputra river, much of it is in China and then it comes, takes a U-turn, an unusual river to take a very, very big U-turn. And then after it's taken a U-turn, it comes down into to India. And that's, uh, as you can see, the confluence here. And, uh, you know, you will get uh, the formation of the deltas. Uh, within the Brahmaputra, and I show you a, a sort of an aerial view of one of the largest islands in the Brahmaputra, which is Majuli Island. And again, these islands with their sandbanks surrounding it have unique ecosystems. A lot of these ecosystems really need to be explored, to be documented, to be uh, looked at uh, scientifically before they actually dis disappear. And therefore, in much also, in much of the Indo-Gangetic plain, the so-called flood plain, uh, partly of the Brahmaputra and also you know, part of the, the Ganga and its tributaries, we have this typical area called the Terai. And uh, it's got grasses, it's got fresh water, uh, very tall elephant grasses, a lot of our rhino population also lives within these flood plains of the Terai. Now, to talk about some unique ecosystems, which very few people actually explore and maybe even know about, and I'm drawing your attention to Meghalaya in the Northeast, which has these fantastic limestone caves. It's a whole cave complex. And in these fantastic limestone caves, and that's why I say it's a speleologist delight. A speleologist is a cave explorer because in these caves you get what are blind fish because there is no light in the caves and therefore over evolutionary time the fish lose their eyes because of complete darkness. And these are throwing up some very, very unique species to the world. Uh, I can't talk about come to the Northeast without talking about bamboo. Bamboo is a very important part of Northeast India. And what I have over here is actually a picture taken from Myanmar because I couldn't get a suitable picture from India. There were lots of pictures. But um, I want to tell you a little thing about bamboo. Bamboo is this unusual grass which flowers once in its lifetime, produces tons and tons of seeds. These are bamboo seeds, which are supremely edible. We have tribals and local people collecting these seeds and boiling them and eating them. 
And when bamboo flowers and it flowers over large tracts, the seeds are very favorite food of rats. Rodents love these seeds. Consequently, rodent population shoot up when the bamboos flower. And that's when, uh, in the past, uh, uh, episodes of plague would increase because, as you know, rodents and plague are very closely related. And at such times, the local administrations give rewards to every person uh, for every rat that they can catch in order to keep the rat population down in an organic way without having to spread and spray, uh, you know, toxic uh, rat poisoning elements. So bamboo and plague and uh, seeds, and it's a fantastic ecological process. So now we are climbing back up into the Himalayas where we started. I told you about rhododendrons. And now this is, uh, you know, the conif, the pine trees, the temperate forests that we find in the Himalayas. And uh, uh, here, of course, uh, after this, there won't be trees because this will be beyond the so-called tree line. It is too cold to uh, sustain, you know, uh, and not enough water even for trees to be able to survive beyond the tree line. This is a frontier that I just want to spend two minutes talking about and I call it the canopy frontier. We have tall forests in India, not as tall perhaps as we would get in Southeast Asia in the equatorial region, but as I said in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands and in Northeast India, where we have lots of tropical evergreen forest, most of us do not know what is present on the top of the canopies. And science is telling us that there is a whole different world on top of the canopies. So how do we get to the top of the canopies to look at the ecosystems there? And people have been very intrepid and are doing uh, climbing, uh, tree rope climbing, single rope climbing, People are also using uh, very sturdy trees to build tree platforms and then have a whole network of connected tree platforms so one can move from one to another. Some innovative people have tried to bring in what are called canopy cranes. So like we have skyscrapers in, in cities that are built by these gigantic cranes, uh, there are several sites in the world where a canopy crane has been brought in which will rotate and then allow uh, researchers to sample the organisms that are indeed found to be quite unique up in the canopy and very different from what we find on the forest floor. Because remember, the canopy is often 30 to 40 meters tall or even more, can even get up to 60 meters tall. Now, I started by talking about macrocosms, mesocosms, and now uh, I told you about artificial microcosms of petri dishes and flasks. But here we have our own microcosms like a flask where you culture bacteria, but these are pictures of the uh, um, Nepenthes cassiana pitcher plant. This is the only species of pitcher plant we have in India. So it's important that we study it and study it well. And here you can see that the pitcher plant is a carnivorous plant. So it has digestive enzymes in the fluid in the pitcher, which will digest all the organisms that fall into it. However, there are also organisms that are resistant to these enzymes, like uh, pitcher mosquitoes. Mosquitoes can get resistant to everything. And you have a whole set of very unique mosquito species that breed within this fluid in the pitcher plant. We know that uh, carnivorous pitcher plants only produce their pitchers when the soil is nitrogen poor. 
when the soil is depleted of nitrogen. And that's why they get their nitrogen from these uh, insects that they lure into the pitcher and then they digest them. And uh, these pitcher plants are usually found in the northeast, in parts of Assam and in parts of Meghalaya. In my own work, I study microcosms, and these are figs that I'm sure you have also eaten, and I've spent a lot of my time, besides other things, uh, looking at the environment within these microcosms, and I found a whole world inside with different species of wasps, with nematodes, with flies, with predators, with all sorts of wonderful creatures, within these tiny microcosms. Now, just to, to, uh, to wind down, I've been telling you about natural ecosystems, but in India, we also have agro-ecosystems or agricultural systems. So here we have uh, mustard fields, we've got wheat fields, we have rice fields, and we have as an example of plantations. We've got a coconut plantation and then we've got uh, you know, uh, mangoes and other uh, plants that uh, we require for uh, human consumption. So obviously the natural ecosystems are shrinking because uh, these agro-ecosystems uh, are expanding. So the issue is how do we draw the balance between natural ecosystems and uh, the ecosystems that humans require for their own subsistence. And this slide just tells you again, uh, gives you a list of all the different types of uh, places where you have the Rabi crops that you might would have learned and the Kharif crops. Uh, based again on the two monsoons that I had told you about earlier. The last two slides in my presentation, because I, I told you about um, um, the laterite porous rocks in uh, the Western Ghats and in other places in India. And here is this room in, in, in uh, Kerala. They have uh, uh, water well systems, beautiful systems, uh, in order to tap into subterranean aquifers. And within these subterranean aquifers, you have these whole amazing fish uh, populations that never, you know, come out of these aquifers and are entirely subterranean. Uh, they are not necessary, they're not blind, they're not like the cave fish because they do, you can see that they do have eyes. So there are some parts where the subterranean aquifers do come up, uh, you know, into uh, kind of uh, uh, water bodies that can be seen from the surface, but they are indeed connected. And this is a whole fantastic system that is waiting to be even uh, more explored. Now we know that India, because of various uh, energy reasons have had to dam many of its rivers. But what do fish do in such rivers that are dammed? Because many of our fish have, they do a migration upwards. So they are born in one place, they become mature in another place downstream, and then they, have, they go back up in order to breed. So they have to go upstream. And here you can see a natural upstream migration of fish. But if the river is dammed, what can the fish do? And people have now come up with these so-called artificial fish ladders. So they build these ladders on the sides of these dams, presuming that the fish can use these ladders. And here you can see, you know, one fish trying to make this upward journey. Right, so this is my last slide and this is from Bombay where uh, the place that I think I am very, very much connected to.
This is the city of Bombay, which has uh, a national park at its doorstep. And because it has a national park at its doorstep, it has leopards at its doorstep. And these leopards now, and you can, this is taken from uh, the national park, Sanjay Gandhi National Park. There's a big program now to study the leopards in this park. And you can see the leopard looking down in the night on the lights of Bombay. And there are many cases now of human leopard conflict. So this is just again to remind you that, yes, we've got a lot of ecosystems in India. And I hope I've given you a flavor of those ecosystems. But um, we have to learn how to, you know, live with these ecosystems uh, and coexist. So I'll end here and uh, thank you very much. And if we have time, I'm happy to take questions. The first question is from Maitreyi B. Uh, it's, a, it's a comment. Wow, I didn't know we have so many Indian dinosaurs. Yes, and we the have second, to preserve the them one. before they they go away. They are ground up in all these mining and other activities. We've got to preserve them. Imagine using dinosaur eggs as grinding stones. I mean, that to me is... I mean, we're doing it out of ignorance. We can't blame people, but we, we who know, we have to do something about it. Just a comment here, my alma mater, Indian Statistical Institute in Kolkata actually has a dinosaur skeleton. And this is, this is, from, this dinosaur is from India. Yeah. There is a question from the same person. Dad, it's called Hi. Marapasaurus Tagore. It was discovered on the centenary of Rabindranath Tagore. And it's called Marapasaurus. Oh, yes. Bara is big, yes. Ba is leg, so it has big feet. Yes. Yes. Actually, I wanted to put a slide of that, but then I thought I had too many slides. It's a lovely slide of Tagore and the dinosaur. Uh, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. And most of them, of course, have been discovered in the Narmada Godavari Basin. Uh, madam, uh, I have an interest about one thing you talked about, a very interesting uh, idea of the agricultural ecosystems normally we only talk about the natural ecosystems and never go to that area uh, recently i am working on a, a museum that primarily concerns uh, about uh, the grains and crops and fresh uh, vegetables and fruits uh, of india and i came across the works of uh, nikolai vavilov uh, finding out the origin of diversity uh, about uh, all these grains and crops. Uh, is there any similar uh, study in Indian context uh, uh, where we really know that uh, uh, what are the origin of diversity for uh, Indian eco agricultural ecosystems and uh, some particular items? Uh, yes, yeah. so I'm so happy you brought this up and I'd like to. Uh, so we do not have enough work on that, but let us say, let us take uh, uh, the Brinjo. And we all know the great controversy of, you know, the BT Brinjal and all of that uh, thing. India is actually the epi one of the epicenters of Brinjal diversity. Okay. And we have many wild relatives also of the Brinjal present in India. And if you look throughout India, we have something like, I don't know, 70, 80 varieties. And imagine, and I'm sure all of you would have known, you know, seen the different types in your local markets, uh, such a huge diversity. And uh, all of this would have uh, likely been homogenized by a single variety that, you know, would come in. So I think uh, we need to, and we are encouraging very much research projects wherever we can to look at centers of diversity of crop relatives. We know there are many uh, legumes which have wild relatives. You know, we've domesticated them, but they've got wild relatives in India. And uh, brinjols I've already told you about. There are many other fruit and other uh, 
horticultural things also. So we really need a focus. And uh, I'm hoping very hard that uh, ICAR will take all of this very seriously. And we are trying to revive, uh, make this part of uh, an agriculturist curriculum. You know, so agricultural scientists learn about crop relatives and exactly what you said, you know, what Vavilov did, uh, we need to do for our own country. Huh? A similar experience I also had about another thing and I would like to ask you one question about that. Uh, once after the Ayla hit a part of West Bengal very severely, I had a chance to visit uh, some parts of the Sundarban areas. And there I found that some of our uh, farmers, they reported that they have lost all livelihood because their lands have grown so saline that they cannot cultivate paddy on it. And I casually asked one of them that, is it possible? I did not know about anything. I just, it was just a curiosity. I asked, is it possible to grow paddy on the saline water? And they said, yes, we had it 50 years back, but we have lost this skill and also lost mm -hmm. the seed altogether. And now we don't have anything. I mean, is there anything happening towards preserving this biodiversity uh, so that we can also find yes. these situations later on? Okay, so let me give you an example of two states where I have some familiarity. One is Goa, my native state. Goa has what are called Khazan lands, where traditionally Goa has all these, uh, you know, uh, brackish, it is creeks where the rivers come in and there are creeks of brackish water and these uh, creek areas get flooded. So the Khazan lands traditionally had the brackish paddy, but today a lot of the brackish paddy has gone because uh, People want to buy basmati and you know whatever. So uh, the Goa government is trying uh, unsuccessfully to revive uh, brackish salt water tolerant uh, paddy in the Kazan lands. In Kerala, they have now prevented people from selling uh, lands that were earlier under paddy cultivation, uh, which had the salt water tolerant uh, paddy. So you can't convert that into a resort or this or that. So the Kerala government is now trying to bring in some restrictions to at least conserve that uh, flow of water. Because if you don't conserve the flow of water, it might become hypersaline, you know, and then the salinity tolerance, which of the uh, evolved populations would, would you know, not uh, be suitable. So uh, we need to bring in these kind of sensitivities about processes, natural processes. But uh, I, yeah, it's the more people who understand and are able to convince, you know, the powers that be, and I think exactly there lies the scope of understanding the power of diversity. If we don't recognize it, we don't preserve it uh, uh, anyway. Absolutely. And uh, another point that you brought in, probably I'm taking too much of time, but uh, I promise this is the no. last one that I'm asking. <laughs> uh, the issue is uh, uh, very recently, once I had uh, written some mails to you also regarding that, uh, that of late we are talking a lot about the interaction of the interaction of uh, different sort of uh, uh, animal diversity and uh, what you said, the uh, human population. And as a result, probably species jumps are happening like uh, uh, we saw in COVID and uh, other sort of uh, species jumps. And now, uh, as an ecologist, uh, how do you see it? I mean, what is the dynamics of such situations? Which way are we moving? And what we should do about that uh, uh, so that uh, such untowards events doesn't happen once more? Um. Species jumps are happening because humans are coming into closer contact with uh, wild ecosystems. You know, like if you have 
in this case maybe bats or in uh, whatever other organisms like mongooses or pangolins where pangolins are in the wild and you only occasionally you don't really come into close contact but when we either have live markets where we bring in these species as may have happened with live markets in the center of origin of uh, uh, covid pandemic may have uh, or because humans have encroached into wild habitats so that you know you have your apartment block right next to a bat roosting site where earlier the bats had ample space uh, so you are going to get into these uh, you know contacts so we need to have space for the wild ecosystems and space for humans and somehow draw this balance it's a difficult task but unless we earmark so called um, untouchable spaces or build corridors so that organisms can connect uh, it's going to be very difficult and we should expect more such possibilities in the future I, I, it's not an easy question to answer. I don't That's have right. an easy answer for you. No. Probably we, we still have to search a lot to, and uh, think we about We have to, also. of course, you know, human populations also are exploding in some parts of the world, not in all parts. And uh, yeah. And one last point, if I may bring in, uh, in Professor Gadgil's uh, book, uh, uh, This Fishered Land, uh, he mentioned about uh, a few stories, even in the uh, new green history of the world, it has been mentioned that uh, some ecologies can completely convert uh, because of the uh, human and interactions, particularly the uh, Little Island uh, ecology story that uh, uh, they have explained over there. But uh, do you think it's a very strong possibility within the Indian conditions right now? And if so, which are the areas that we should be more careful about? A difficult question again, because as you know, everybody has aspirations. You cannot, everybody wants a cell phone. Everybody wants a television set. Every, I mean, these are human aspirations, right? Having uh, achieved those things, you can't very well now tell people that uh, it's okay, you should not have it. How do you control human aspirations? So um, I think it's uh, unfortunately humans, because you know we are uh, uh, evolutionarily, we have short term perspectives. We cannot have think long term. We have uh, our intellectual ability to think long term, but we are all about short term gains. That's how we are hardwired, because that's how natural selection is all about short term gains. So you want something now, you want something now for you, your children and your grandchildren, right? And you want it immediately. You're not willing to think that, okay, I should scale back leave something for 10 generations down. That's not how uh, we are wired. We are hardwired for short-term gains. So unless some you know, great restrictions are put on us by uh, the conditions of the globe, and it's coming, as we will see, the next wars will be fought about water. That is what the resource that we are going to fight about, yes? The next wars are, are already possibly being fought about rare earths because we all want the mobile phone, but this is full of rare earths. And only certain countries have access to the rare earths. This is going to be the big, <laughs> the big frontier, right? So these are... Um, these are questions that uh, are not very easy to answer, unfortunately.
Thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful uh, lecture. It was so enjoyable and so illuminating. Thank you so much. Thank you. There appear to be no more questions, but uh, I think uh, Manushda's uh, questions brought out a lot of interesting <laughs> uh, facts, uh, quite unexpected, but yeah, hard truths. Thanks very much for that. You're welcome, and thank you for inviting me. Yes? Thank you very much.